everybody. My name's Lucy Walters and this is my friend and colleague, uh, Denise Playford. We're both members of the research committee and we're being supervised today by the new chair of the research committee, um, Jonathan Newbury. So thank you very much and I'd like to acknowledge Jonathan. I'd also like to acknowledge the Larrakee yeah, people. Yeah, okay, one job at a time, that's yeah. right. I'd also like to acknowledge the Larrakee people on whose land we meet today and their elders past, present and future. So um, we're hoping this is a discussion rather than um, a, a major presentation. As members of the research committee, we've had from time to time registrars, particularly uh, independent pathway regis, but also registrars from RTOs at times say, gosh, we've got somebody who's doing their AST in remote medicine or in public health and they need some support with their project. And um, we're here today to give you a bit of an outline but also to encourage you to get help and get help early. Mm. So um, in the research committee, occasionally we've had people um, contact us and say, look, I'm in Catherine and I've got to do a research project. I've got an idea. How can I help? And usually the research committee's answer to that is, who do we know that has some research um, knowledge and, and interest and expertise, like Denise, who um, we could say, why don't you phone this person and they can talk through with, with you how you're going. Perhaps before we go further, can I just get a show of hands? Who is in the process of doing a project for one of their ASTs that, oh, fantastic, magnificent. Which AST are you guys doing? Pop Health, fantastic. Great. Aboriginal Health, fantastic. That's great. And who hasn't yet started an AST and is thinking it's bloody scary and I want some help right now? Oh, good, nobody's scared. That's fabulous. Or maybe <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, what about who could possibly supervise someone who's going to do well and be scared? Yeah, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fantastic. Okay, so what um, I'd like to do then is perhaps hand over to Denise and get her, um, her a story from her about how perhaps we could go about this. Okay, sounds good. I've got a roaming mic too, so I can... So uh, everybody in every scenario, every project that you do, I guess, starts at the same point. So it doesn't matter whether you're new or you've done it a million and one times. Um, it always starts with you thinking about how you're going to do it. Um, and that, that the how and the mechanics are actually really um, significant and they're not that difficult. Uh, there's a series of steps that you walk through uh, to be able to get yourself uh, to a proposal that's very acceptable and ready to go. So I, I've actually used one of my student um, proposals in this act to animate this a little bit um, because when, when things are going, you, where, where you start from, there's always going to be kind of mistakes that you make along the way. So there's no shame in that. And certainly for myself, as somebody who does a lot of research, I always run my ideas past colleagues because they always find holes in what you're going to do. So there's no shame in it. It's just a developmental process that everybody kind of observes. And it's actually probably the most important thing, I think, in terms of you know, having marked a number of AST um, projects, you know, it, it, there's, it's really obvious when people haven't asked, you know, got some feedback early and they've kind of set themselves up with an impossible question and you think, oh, you know, you read the research question, you think, oh, fuck, we're going to be in trouble. How are we going to get it? You know, like, so if you don't have that, if you, you know, if you haven't got somebody going, oh, shit, this one needs some help when you submit because you did that, in you know week two of your AST, that's really helpful. Oh, sorry, and it's and it's absolutely you know kind of university protocol. So if you're going to be doing one of those great big NHMRC applications in my university, you have to do it six weeks before it's due, so that it can go through exactly this process. So like I say again, it's just standard. So you might have done some really good background reading. Um, you've come come up with some ideas about the topic area. Um, you might even have some kind of a hypothesis, but you know the number of projects that I get that don't actually have an answerable research question, you know, there's, there's so many that haven't come up with a, a topic that you can actually answer. So this particular student um, came up with aims 
they came up with a hypothesis that the factors that were important to women in maintaining uh, G GP workforce, um, they said that that was the same as men, but they didn't come. So what are you answering in this this um, initial question? So, so for those of you that are already embarked on doing a project, do you feel that you've got a good research question and did you want to have a little bit of a discussion around the idea of a research question? We've got a roving mic. So, so I'll speak loud. Can I start? That's the uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've the about We're broadcasting remotely. Oh, sorry, so. I'm open Okay, um, just the, the operational side of it, I've just been given different advice that, I, that ASTs in pop health can only be done um, after some time in the program, just like the rules earlier, and also if it can be done part-time if you're already part of an academic unit. I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to answer that question, or Lucy? I will run it for you. Do you want to answer the question? Yes, so... Um, so, so this is academic policy, not college policy. You've got to do a good project. So if, um, if you were getting on with it and progressing and you were doing it part-time or slower than Macrum uh, expected you to do it, I would give you lots of slack to do it, just as long as you're doing it right. Um, and so, uh, so the only one I've supervised in recent years was long overdue and he was going to lose his provider number and all sorts of things. And so I wrote a few supporting letters to Akram and said, we're getting on with it, we've got a good project. Um, so is, is that the answer to your question? And then, he, and then Akram cut him some slack. It's just once again, you guys are amazing that Akram is flexible, but there has been a suggestion that it can only be done after, sorry. <laughs> just if we can get clarity from Akram in the sense that I, I was told that it uh, had to be done full time after you've done the other assessments, and I wasn't sure if that was correct. No, my understanding is that um, ASTs can be done at any time in the training and there are people that do it before they do other things. And I think this is really important because it depends what else is going on with your life and how you're managing the exams and things. Um, what's really important is that when you submit a project, that project goes to the censor, and the, um, David Campbell, and he has to approve the project. And really it's at that point that we as research committee people get involved because if he gets at a project, a proposal that's just frightening and, and, and it's usually because there isn't a research question or there isn't consideration around ethics, the, the proposal will be rejected. Um, and then again, there is, you know, you know, sure, we'd really like, you know, this is supposed to be a one year plan, but again, um, I haven't had any problems with the sensor. I've been involved with two projects that took longer, but when we were able to de describe why the project was taking s longer and, and demonstrate that it was being it, it was in good hands, there wasn't a problem. It's just that we know sometimes projects are languishing because you know they're a disaster, and it's actually better to go. No, let's stop now. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So the next thing, once you've come up with a research question that everybody agrees is a genuine question and is actually a gap in the literature, so you're not just going to repeat something that somebody has done before that you should know about. The next thing that, that it's really important to think about is the design, the study design. So obviously you're going to be in different contexts and so there are some things that you probably cannot do in your context. Um, so you really have to think, is this a doable thing? And again, I say it's very practical. So you need to think about, does your question require that you have a control group? Um, and if you do need to have a control group, can you actually muster up enough people um, to be able to act either as the case or a control? So I think just practical things like numbers. Um, for this, you probably need to know a statistician. So you need to know how many people you'd need to recruit in your proposed study um, to be able to come up with a statistical, st statistically significant result. Um, so for this, um, Lucy, you might... Um yeah, so again, this is where what we often do is to phone a friend, and we've got quite a number of friends, particularly within the rural clinical schools and the regional training organisations now that have got research um, ex and experience. 
Um, most of the time what I find good supervisors do is help you to make your project smaller. So, you know, I'm going to cure cancer in remote areas <laughs> of the world is probably slightly larger than an AST is need, but, you know, what is the outcome of skin cancers excised in my rural practice, you know, um, is a clinical audit and it might be quite reasonable as long as it's bounded in the um, in the literature and so you've got a comparison. So we, we can do clever research, we can do clinical audit, and the most you know the most helpful thing that your supervisor can do to start with is make your project somewhere between 10 and 90 percent smaller than you planned initially. Okay? And if you're getting other advice, go speak to someone else. <laughs> Um, sorry, go ahead. So, and again, um, if, if you know you are needing really clever statisticians, that's where um, we've had, even with independent pathway people, we've had in, been able to engage them with rural clinical schools particularly um, and provide them with some support. And it's often a quid pro quo, you're an independent pathway person. We, are you happy to take a student on placement and, by, and if you do that, we'll provide you with the stats support that you need for your, for your research project. So phone, phone a friend. If you don't know the friends because you're in an area that you don't know well, then get in touch with, um, with uh, the staff at ACRAM or with us at the, at the um, research committee and we'll help you find a friend. And I guess one of the other things that we need to think about that was part of the research question is that it should be something that you actually want to know the answer for. Um, because if you're doing it, this is going to take a bit of time um, and you're going to get really bored if you really aren't interested in the answer. Um, and it should be something that when you run it past your friends and colleagues that they find it quite exciting at, as a topic area. Um, and so, so think, think carefully about doing something that's small. So there's no, the um, problem with questions, if you're going to make a national study, um, the amount of data that you'll need to collect will be way beyond what's possible. So as like Lucy said, just something local um, and immediately interesting to answer. So a couple of really good examples that I've seen recently was somebody asked questions about, you know, what is the, um, the likelihood and a range of anemia in Aboriginal patients in Catherine? you know, in, in, in my GP practice in, in Catherine? Or, um, you know, what, what is the outcome of um, assessing and clearing or, or, or triaging um, uh, um, uh, neck pain on the ski slopes when we only have a lateral, lateral X-ray option? You know, so this isn't, there isn't a protocol for this, but we've got to do it because we can't get everybody, you know, down off the slopes to have this. So, you know, what really is the result? So they're really nice, neat questions about the fact that our realities of our practice are constrained and, and aren't able to be. Yeah. Just to add, like, you might think about this about as, as an assessment item because obviously we're assessing certain higher order skills, um, critical thinking, project management, research skills that you can't assess other ways. But there's so many other benefits. The, the first is you're developing those skills in yourself. Like many other things, you don't learn tennis from reading a book about it. You go and practice it, you do it, make a few mistakes, you get better. But I think as Lucy's alluding to, that these are also questions that are useful to the, to the community you work in and you're contributing to broader scientific knowledge. So they're kind of fitting in with broader aims of a profession and vocational training beyond just an assessment piece. And I think thinking about the aim of that, and it's not just a thing to get over and a thing to do, it's actually a thing to learn, to develop, to maybe, um, as Julianne said this morning, develop skills that might take you to places you just got no idea. Hmm. And Lucy's two examples, I mean, there probably isn't any existing literature about anemic rates in Catherine. Short. Yeah, that's short review. But there is more generically. And, and the cervical spine injury, I mean, there's a big literature about assessing cervical spine following falls. And, you know, uh, so there is that we, you would expect to see a lot more literature reviewed in that cervical spine example than in um, the Catherine example. <coughs> yeah, 
So you have to also think that maybe the um, the, the basis of the, the um, literature that is out there may be um, challenging to find. So you need to um, become really familiar with public search engines like ProQuest. Um, and med, um, and if you've got friends that are in the university practice, then Medline. So so sometimes the, the questions that you think are so new and novel and have never been looked at actually have been searched. So don't don't uh, don't be too quick in your look at the literature. There there is often a lot of stuff out there. So um, find yourself a friend who can do a good lit search with you and for you. Um, ethics is an incredibly important part of the research journey. I've just had a student who's come um, afoul of an ethics process. So, so when you're um, having to start a project that requires ethics, as in you want to publish it, you're dealing with sensitive information, you're dealing with population groups who might be considered to be at risk, the ethics process may well take up to a year uh, to get things through. So it's something that you do need to think about when you're beginning your project. Um, and you need to be very patient to get ethics through because it does ask a lot of nitpicky details around how you're going to get consent for your po particular population group. If it's not possible, why is it not possible? Um, you need to be really familiar with uh, the National Health and um, Medical Research Council guidelines, which is a very fat 120 page document, um, but it does have very specific stuff around your population. So if you're, for example, going to be working with um, Aboriginal populations, it has a section specific to it, and there are a lot of things that you need to be additionally aware of um, around consultation processes, information process um, and respect processes um, that are unique uh, to the group that you're working with. Um, and you won't be able to get ethics past the ethics board if you haven't thought about those things. So again, you, it's like the um, assessment guidelines, you do unfortunately do need to be aware of those. Um, and you also need to be thinking whether you need which ethics committees you might need to go past. So if you're just doing a standard small pro, uh, project in a GP practice, then any university ethics process will cover GP. Um, GP has its own ethics committee as well, so you can su submit to either ACRAM or, or to, um, or, or to RACGP, which gets recognised by ACRAM, um, or you might need to go to an Aboriginal ethics committee. But these, these do take time, don't they, Lucy, and they do need to be considered. They do. I think that um, it depends the state that you're in, but most state departments of health also have an ethics committee. I'm most familiar, obviously, with the South Australian one. And what they've done now, which is great, is they have an inquiry process where you can kind of do a bit of a brain dump and having spoken to a, your friend and said, this is what I plan to do. And then they'll say, Oh, okay, if you're doing this within your own general practice, it's retrospective de-identified data and you're not, you know, you know, you're submitting it as a project but you're not planning to publish, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you don't need anything more than just telling us and we've approved that this is all you need. Um, and, but um, do have a little, um, you know, further chat with your supervisor because it is often an opportunity to present at conference and things like that. You may need to let the ethics committee know that you're interested in presenting at a conference and they may say, okay, well, you need to fill in these additional forms. I, when I think about a research project, I think a third of the work is to get ethics approval and it feels like, oh my God, I haven't even started. Mm. But actually what you've done is you've planned all of the things. It's like, it's like planning for a wedding. More than a third of the work happens before the day the party and the aftermath, that, that's, you know, that's cool stuff too. But actually, if you get that right, that third of the work, the rest is easy, mm. okay? The rest is really easy. You've almost written half of what you need to present to ACRAM if you've written an ethics. Um, and you've all th already thought about how you're going to collect the data or whether you're going to phone a friend or whether the admin assistant can at the, hos at the hospital or the clinic can help you already got all of those systems in play and the rest will go smoothly. So at the, again, these are all the prefatory things that you need to do to be able to demonstrate that your project is doable. Um, so you need to think about, you've got your research question, you're okay, that you don't, you're not going to present anywhere so you don't need ethics, but we need to know, you know, what kind of data you expect to collect to, to be able to, ACRAM will need to know that, be, enable to assess whether your project is doable. 
Um, so if you, again, want to do something that's bigger than just your own GP practice, we need to know that you have access to other, other practices' data um, and that the data that you're collecting is going to be able to answer the, um, the question that you're, going to, that you're asking. So, you know, very basic things um, around um, are you going to collect data that's just a, a category? Um, so in which case that's going to change the kind of analyses that you do? Are you going to collect data that's, that's continuous data? So is it going to be like, you, um, uh, I don't know, the, the day's gestation? Um, so just simple stuff that, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So any, any, for those of you that are thinking about projects, have you already got to the level of thinking about the kind of data that you're going to be collecting? Yeah. Yeah, so what kind of data do you think you're going to... So I'm looking at collecting uh, retrospective data, um, basically going back through EDIS, um, de-identified, potentially re-identifiable if required, but um, basically looking at, at trends over time. So it should be, it's low to negligible ethics, um, ethics required for publication. Um, but the data will be dependent on EDIS, which is, um, I, I don't know if all the states have no. EDIS. So EDIS is our emergency department information system, um, which it's got a few, uh, there's a few things that can go wrong in terms of your data entry. You're sometimes limited in what you can put in as your diagnosis because it's a click box. Um, so there's not always the right box and you have to pick the nearest available um, so there's a few sources of data error, but I think most of my health service has now been on EDIS for two years, which should give me sort of two years retrospective data, but then it also goes forward as well. And just looking at numbers as much as anything else. So the ethics boards are all controlled by the NHMRC standards. So I think if you were looking at data that someone had collected for a project and with existing ethics, they would say that's negligible risk, so reanalysis of existing data. But I don't think your EDIS fits that criteria because it's not data that's ever been collected for research. So I think you'd have to go to, so it's low risk, I agree, and it's de identified, but I think you would have to get your own ethics approval. Can you just tell us what your research question is? I've just. Well. I've sort of got um, a few different research questions in varying stages of development. Good. Um, yeah, <laughs> we so know that feeling. Yeah. Um, but uh, the first one I probably really want to um, get cracking along is looking at um, cardiac pre acute cardiac presentations to the emergency department, looking at STEMI, non-STEMI and arrest. Um, so just limiting that subset. So just trying to take arrhythmias and chest pains and all the slightly less acute presentations out, but then being able to compare that by date and then look at the weather patterns for that day and then look at the correlation between cardiac presentations and weather. There's a fair bit of overseas and metro data that um, is around. There isn't a whole heap that's been done in Australia. There's a couple of studies from Brisbane, but there's um, a lot of that has most likely a different pollution profile. So it takes away the um, so, so your question is something like: um, Does do, the weather, do, 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 do does extreme weather, weather affect events affect our cardiac presentations in our rural emergency departments? Perfect. Mm. That's really good. Mm. That's really neat. And you've got it's not even cardiac; it's STEMI and non-STEMI presentations. Yeah. And then, um, how do you define what are your variable of of um, weather? You know. I'm talking to the Bureau of Meteorology and probably going to go with their, um, their definitions just for the sake of ease. Um, there's a whole heap of ways you can define events, um, severe weather events, particularly heat waves. So there's uh, data that shows correlations between um, heat waves, uh, individual hot days and cold snaps and they all tend to have their own risk profiles that go with them. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so we said before about good literature research, so you need to know that. Um, and I would, I would think that the um, the association is not going to be very strong, which means you need a very large sample. So I would say do this as a descriptive project to develop the method of doing it, and which would satisfy ACRAM and then enrol in the PhD to do the big study. 
It's a PhD study. Uni university of your choice. Uh, Tegwin Howe from the Emergency Medicine Foundation. Um, I have a team who support research across uh, emergency medicine research across Queensland largely, but actually is now across Australia. Can I just flag that dealing with the ethics committees in Queensland particularly can be interesting? And even though there's the NH and MRC, do not assume that once you've got what you think is approval, that every HHS is going to agree to it because. Um, how does one put this politely? Some are quite difficult, and even <laughs> so, I'm trying to find a nice way to say it. So, even though, for example, you may have approval from Metro South, do not assume mm -hmm. that you will get approval from Townsville. Okay. So, for example, I did a study and I got approval for this for the study, and, and the issue was the staff. Oh, sorry, I got approval for my study with one HHS, and the biggest I spent the most time with one satellite say one satellite station that, I, that had all these pedantic things that they needed me to do. Um, so, you know, the study was already approved and yet this other so can ethics I, committee had a view yes. about what was required. So from the purposes of getting through your AST, can I also, um, you know, suggest to you that one of the nice things, confusing but nice things about the AST is it's very clear that you don't have to have a research report as your outcome. So it may, you know, in fact, if you read it, you can have anything as the outcome kind of thing, which is terrible and wonderful all at once. So if you find you get bogged down in ethics, it'll be really important for you to communicate with ACRAM and the sensor. And it may be that your outcome from for the purposes of AST and fellowship is a literature review and a research protocol because you know that will de demonstrate that you've developed the skills that we need for a fellowship in Akram with a you know pop health AST and you know you could present that here as you know and you don't need ethics to present a research protocol and then if you get bogged down and it takes you longer to get that bit as part of your three years of PhD that's fine, don't let it stop your fellowship. Okay, so I think one of the things that's really important is the reason that we need to present our AST, a research proposal to the censor, is so they make sure you're not biting off a PhD in order to get a fellowship. But also things happen and we know that, and it may be that it's not your initial study, but it's the research, a lit review and a research protocol that would easily meet the requirements of fellowship. Okay, and one of the one of the fi the final aspects of a research protocol is the research timeline, where you realistically say to get ethics for this project would take me one year. Therefore, it is not realistic for me to be able to complete this project. But I understand what's required, um, and so the pro the research protocol the timeline is where you break everything down till it's little bite sized chunks, um, and 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 show you know what that you've already thought about what's required for a, um, an adequate protocol. You've just got to know how to add columns into Excel, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> add month yeah. columns. Yeah. The other thing is, as a supervisor of person doing a research project, I really, um, you know, propose that you think yourself about whether you've got a project that can be take little pieces can be taken off, so that you know I've now developed a research ethics proposal for, um, you know, a number of quite large projects. And if we have registrars that turn up and say, I want to do something obstetrics, I can say, look, I've got this umbrella thingy and would you like to do this little bit of it? So that then they do need to put in an ethics modification. I make them interview me so that they know they're not going to join a research team that's going to be on the front page of the advertiser next week. You know, they're taking a risk joining my, my, my project. But so we can find um, ways in which they can... Um, get through some of that efficiently and yet contribute to a team. Sorry. I guess I've actually looked at it in reverse and looked yes. at how I can look at developing small projects, proving that they work, and then using that same protocol and template and then Perfect. rolling it out into other rural communities and over other topics. So the next thing you might want to look at would be whether diabetes or respiratory or... Perfect, yeah. And then that can then be rolled 
into another community if you can bit debug it in one area and then roll it across. Yeah. And part of a good timeline is also being respectful around community consultation. Um, so if you do need to do community consultation with health providers, with you know anybody in that on the ground, that does need to be factored in, and it's a sign of an ethical process that you've done. So if that's on your timeline. Sorry, me again. If anyone else to ask, just ask. Um, just operational again. Just reading the um, documents, the supervisors suggest that it has to be a fellow of Akram or a doctor. Um, if I don't have that situation, do I have to link with someone that is and then have that relationship? So certainly we've um, had a number of uh, independent pathway people who've connected with researchers like Denise and like um, Pascal, who was supposed to be here but she's on an aeroplane, who are non-doctor researchers that know rural and remote well. So um, uh, if you're having difficulty, I think the best thing is to contact either the research committee or, or the censor and we'll find we'll find a plan for you. Cool. Okay, so um firstly um I hope that this has been a little bit of, of information about um the ASTs that we provide. Certainly we're working as a, as a committee and I'd like to re particularly recognise Denise and Pascal's contribution to see if we can provide some more resources online um, um, on the ACRAM website. Um, but really I think probably the most important thing is to choose somebody to support you in your journey wisely and, if, and you've probably got the right person if they're trying to shrink your project. Thanks very much, everybody, and um, please keep us committed.